This month, our guest is Dan Friedrich. Uh, he's a veteran who's traveled his journey home through PTSD, moral injury, and uh, stimulant addiction during the past few years. Dan has piloted frontline mental health peer support models. Uh, he's committed to evolving methods to hold space, open recovery, build rapport, and establish trust with mental health providers as he walks alongside veterans on their healing journey. Uh, he's a certified peer integration specialist and works as a psychedelic facilitator with the SNAP Lab. All right, and uh, without further ado, uh, this is Dan Friedrich. Hey, good morning, y'all. How you doing? Pretty um, well, man. <laughs> thanks, thanks for that bio, Alex. I appreciate it. Um, so I'm Dan. I like tacos and hiking. I also like to do a lot of work, and I have a lot of fun in the work that I do, and I want to come here today. I really appreciate the invite to come talk to you a little bit about uh, some veteran support programs we have going on at NAMI Multnomah, it's National Alliance on Mental Illness, local chapter here in Multnomah County where I live. And um, feel free to ask me questions about the second half of my bio that Alex talked about. But today I'll just focus really on, you know, what we're doing at NAMI and how we're looking to do that. So you can all help me get the word out. And you can also ask me any questions. And if you, if you see areas where you're wondering, like, are you doing this or there's space for this to be happening to this the platform, let me know so I can sort of integrate things. I like to do. What people need versus what i think people need if that makes sense so feel free to tell me if you hear anything that i say and you're like wait a minute it'd be kind of cool if you gave everybody a free pizza let me know whatever it might be um i'm open to it so i started working in nami as a volunteer about three four years ago um like alex said i mean i went through my own recovery process with ptsd moral injury um um not an ordinary stage of consciousness was a big part of my moral injury recovery for me it was you know a sweat lodge series i got into doing peer support work and I wanted to do it like in a new way. I wanted to find a way to really hold space and listen versus, you know, come flying through the hatch with a bunch of ideas and really get somebody kind of, I think, frazzled with that and just kind of find a way to support someone going inside themselves and starting to talk about what their inner healing intelligence, what was going on inside themselves and informing them in the process. And then, then from there, trying to link up folks with uh, resources to things in our community that I know have been helpful to myself and others and just start to experiment and see what was helpful for folks um, as opposed to having like a power dynamic where I'm telling somebody what they need that makes sense or just assuming that different resources may be helpful because they say we support veterans we support the community like really trying to suss out where real help is happening and where real integrative processes are going on um, so that's me saying that when I started doing this work people said hey you do this in kind of a weird way. <laughs> I never really understood what they meant, but I took it as a compliment. And I think that, you know, I decided though I needed to have a place to, to sort of experiment with these things and find out whether they worked or not. So um, Oregon Health Authority and ODVA were looking for peers to go into the emergency department at Providence Portland Medical Center. And um, a few resources had tried, but no one had really figured out how to do that model. And um, it was the middle of COVID and 2022, like the pandemic. And um, I'm a pretty extroverted person, so I'm isolating at home and I'm starting to go a little crazy. And I decided, hey, uh, um, I will go work at emergency department because that sounds healthier for me than, than staying at home in this space. And so really quickly, what I noticed in the emergency department is that I only had a little bit of time um, the bulk of people that I'm serving are in a non-ordinary state of consciousness. I mean, there's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of different things on board for them. In that space, I really didn't have the time, the flexibility. The, the person I'm working with might not have been in the space for this conversation around what are your next steps? What resources do you want to use? What's going on? Um, so I decided the best thing I could do or the thing that I could do most effectively was just try to create a human experience and give some loving kindness as somebody who's in the emergency department and ex experiencing what one experience is to bring themselves to the emergency department. And that, and that's what peer support was starting to look like. It was starting to look like just going into a room, talking to someone and helping them feel like someone heard them, someone cared, that they weren't getting other, that there's nothing wrong with them. I mean, they're a human being and they're perfect the way that they are. And that this, experience in the ED can be really traumatic and find a way to make it like gentler, kinder, someone that really, really sees someone and really cares about them and their experience. And it, it was started, it started to work. So after about six, seven months of this weird modality of peer support, um, 
we pull the data through the Eddy um, uh, system, which you know pools like 1,000 different hospitals. We found that recidiv recidivism for the folks that I'd worked with um, had reduced 67% post intervention. Uh, people were going out and on their own, um, uh, connecting with their next steps, whatever they might look like, um, via that really open conversation about inner. I didn't call inner healing intelligence the hospital because that'd be different. But I talked about like what's going, like inviting people inside and what touching, touching in with what is, what is your, what is yourself telling yourself right now? Like what, what do you want? What, what are you looking for in there? What's coming up? And you know what will be most helpful. And then just connecting people with some resources very, very gently and saying, here's some ideas. Um, and we found that folks were able to do that on their own, you know, without much support other than just feeling more empowered and feeling like there was hope, and feeling like someone did care and, and then having that extra little bit of motivation to go out there and, and um, do something. I know for myself, I've been in a lot of spaces where it felt really hopeless. Like, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know what's going on. Um, then after a year, we, uh, received the grant from CARE Oregon. We are staffing all the Tri-County Providence Hospital with peer support. Um, I sort of moved up and became, um, I don't like to call myself a supervisor, so I call myself a mentor. I'm a peer, I'm the peer mentor team lead at NAMI. With the work that we did there, I'm a veteran, so this is me serving my community. It was part of my reintegration back into myself, into my community, and all the way to uh, um, be of service in a way that wasn't causing me moral fatigue. Um, so the next step was, okay, where's where's a place out there, or how's a place out there we can insert or install veteran peer support that's not VA? So as I talk about the Veteran Behavioral Health Peer Support Program, we're going to abbreviate that to um, Mul Multnomah Veteran Peer Support. Um, this program started and launched in June. It is now November. We're cruising along. Uh, welcome to the team, Alex. And also, um, Tammy Davis is another peer. We, as we got started, I thought, well, a couple of important factors are one, our, our, our uh, programming is um, free. It is any discharge status, any length of service. It's non VA. Um, the Referral process is so simple that I think a lot of times folks are wondering, like, how is it that simple? It sounds unbelievable. Like, basically, the referral process is we have an online referral form. I know I wouldn't fill an online referral form when I was just getting ready to ask for help and didn't know what I need. So the easiest way to do it is somebody can just give me a call or send me an email to my work phone, and then I'll give them a call back and talk to them. And that's what the referral process looks like. Um, there's really no screen outs for it. So it's no barrier. Um, the barrier that does exist is um, we're unable to travel like out into the community and meet with folks. So we meet with them either on Zoom, phone, or um, at our office on Northeast Gleason in person. So that's the one barrier that does exist is that there's a technology piece. And then also we're unable to like travel around outside. We can work with folks for one day, one time, just one conversation up to six months to a year. There aren't a lot of limits on how long we're able to serve someone. I think that's really important right now. And I'm, I say that thinking about um, some of the VA changes in policy that's causing a lot of termination anxiety in our population right now, our veteran community. And so having a way to um, be able to tell someone like, we can work with you as long as you need us to work with you or, you know, and, you know, we talk about the end of peer support from the beginning that started working with someone, but that's not to say that we were, we're, we're using data that says something like after four, after four visits with me, you're going to be good and you'll be fine. That's all you need is four visits. So we like to keep it in the framework of it, it's, it's open-ended. And we can also talk about things. We can support veterans that are experiencing mental health um, differences and challenges, but also we can support folks who are just like trying to find a place to live. I got two jobs and just go, I don't know what to do. I need some, I need something to bounce ideas off of and talk to. So I'm saying it doesn't have to be mental health. It doesn't have to be behavioral health at all. It can just be life, it can be uh, exiting the military, moving on to the next thing. Um, we also serve active duty military if anyone applies. We have a few uh, National Guard bases and, and a Coast Guard. So we do do outreach and we go out there and talk to folks there. 
uh, by and large, though, the folks that do access our programming are veterans. Um, and we have a peer support specialist pool that is pretty dynamic. I mean, you know, my lived experiences are PTSD, moral injury, and stimulant addiction. My colleague, Tammy, her lived experience are MST and subsequent PTSD. And, you know, being a spouse, working through that domestic violence and things, she um, is there to meet veterans where that identify in that space, looking for a woman identifying peer, female identifying peer to work with. And then we brought in Alex um, <laughs> to help <laughs> to help me out. And we're going to grow a little bit, you know, as, as we continue to grow, we're starting to get solid, like a flow of referrals. As we continue to grow, we're going to expand, obviously, so we don't have wait lists. Um, we serve Oregonian veterans, and we can also serve a limited number of uh, like Southwest Washington. I'm speaking specifically about Vancouver veterans. Um, and I say a limited number because we're still looking for grants for Washington. You know, we have grants from OHA and ODDA, and they like us to serve Oregonian veterans. Um, but there's any way, like a lot of folks receive treatment at the VA, at the Vancouver campus, of Portland VA, specifically in PTSD and addiction recovery there. A lot of times exit that program into the Vancouver community. Um, I still count that like an Oregon veteran if they have any any address in Oregon. <laughs> you know, it could be it could be a previous address for the cat lives, whatever. Um, we don't we we try to make it easy. We try to make it a way to work. If somebody really wants to get receive your services from us, we can make it happen. Um, some of the programming that we get into is like what peers, what as someone could expect working with us. It would be a lot of listening. I really mentor and encourage the folks, myself and the folks working with me to spend, um, like maybe 10 minutes talking during the hour <laughs> they're working with someone really try to get that space for someone to talk about whatever comes up and whatever, whatever way it comes up. And when I think about goals, I'm really thinking about because we we do help someone create goals they like us to. And if they're directing us like, hey, I like to create a goal about making my first appointment or staying in care or I'm pre contemplated for sobriety. What does sobriety look like? What are the steps? What is that? What do I have to do? Um, we can hold space for that and talk about a little experience moving in that place, but also uh, making goals around, you know, someone connecting with things that they enjoy and parts of their life that bring them, bring them happiness, parts of their life that um, can start to move into some practices for self-care and things like that. So also identifying areas in the whole health spectrum, or at least in the, in the whole person to talk about spirituality, to talk about what they do for exercise, they do joyful movement or food or, you know, whatever it might be and bring in whole space for that too. I think that, you know, what we found over time is, is really just be a listening and offering, you know, very unwavering, uh, judgmental compassion that someone really can come up with their own ideas. And that's, I think, the the overarching goal of this is to, you know, whenever someone says like, hey, man, thanks, you you did this for me, you did that for me, I like to reframe that and say, you did all the work, you did it for yourself, and I'm just I'm just happy to be part of your journey. You know, I'm just happy to be part of the piece of this, this puzzle for you. Um, and framing it as like someone did all the work. People like to see someone move to a space where they're able to to navigate through their life and feel like they do have the ability to make those choices and um, learn how to move in that space. So, and when I say we're not VA, I mean it too. I mean, NAMI Multnomah is um, a community, a VA community partner, um, but there's no oversight. They don't touch our programs at all. We basically come in and fill gaps that the VA has, one of them being peer support. So our peer support specialists also go up to uh, 5C, the VA psychiatric inpatient ward. And, RTP and we're also in vet centers and places like that that doing outreach with volunteers like that too. Um, and a lot of those look like just being in the lobby, being someplace and just having a conversation with people again as a human being. So we're not rolling in with like an assessment. We're not rolling in with trying to figure something out or whatever. We're just rolling in with, hey, I'm me, who are you and what's going on? Talk to me about yourself, tell me who you are. Um, so in a nutshell is the VBH PSS program. Um, really quick, there's also a uh, veteran support group that I lead on Thursday nights, 6 to 8.30 p.m., uh, or sorry, 6 to 7.30 p.m., and um, 
it's an open in a group, you know, folks drop in, drop out. We do have about 10 people that come really consistently and we do have conversations about PTSD, moral injury and addiction, but we're just saying by, and by and large, most of the time we're just talking about life. People are giving each other encouragement, affirmations. And I think the fact that I'm sitting with, you know, seven people who have been coming since this group's beginning of the year and a half ago, it's a good sign that something's going well there. Um, and so while I sit with PTSD, moral injury and things, if I hear it come up in the group of things, I don't feel like calling it out, but I will talk about my own experiences and I, and I do share as a veteran as part of the group too. So everyone in the group shares, including the facilitator, we talk about that and really hold that peer, peer led model uh, to heart and, and keep it going. And again, that's a, it's drop in groups, kind of group where someone could come once as many times as they want to. Offering a group live somewhere here in Portland Metro. Um, we're also expanding to uh, LGBTQ plus areas and uh, women specific uh, veteran groups. We have facilitators identified for that and just kind of, I know Alex will do our best to keep you posted as far as when those groups form. And Brian, you know, brought up a really good point, asked me a question before we got started today about support for family members of veterans, spouses, loved ones of veterans. And we do send, uh, Alex, I just sent you an email with that information. It's also on our website, namimolnoma.org. You look, we have a, uh, Alex has a link for, we have a, like a website on our website for all of our veteran programs and families. You got it? Okay. And the family support groups on there. And the uh, so one of the facilitators, Sandra, for the family support group, she is a veteran and the spouse of a veteran also occupies two lived experience areas, can really talk to family members about what's going on. It's also a place for them to hold space, find resources for themselves, and, uh, you know, get some support and things. Um, it's definitely an area that there are huge gaps, and there could be a lot more done for uh, families and, and loved ones of veterans that are out there supporting us in our lives and uh, deserve a lot of care, too. Um, and thus far, you know, the VA really hasn't moved in that space. Um, so we're happy to, <laughs> in lieu. So let anybody know that, that that's in that space. I think when I go out and do outreach, it's, it's a question I get asked about more. I think I have family members come up and ask me for support more than I do veterans coming up and ask me for support at that point. All right, I'll pause there. Does anyone have any questions? I have uh, a question. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned that uh, obviously, um, NAMI will will take uh, people in regardless of discharge status. Uh, do you have <clears throat> people coming in that have an honorable discharge status, but for some reason are avoiding the VA for whatever reason? Is that a situation that comes up, and why would that be? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so experience, I'm, I'm sort of kind of experientially. I mean, a, a big reason I went to Providence, Portland, uh, versus like working at the VA or something like that is because I wanted to, I, I knew, I felt like there were a lot of veterans who were either marginalized or felt marginalized by the VA, didn't identify as a veteran perhaps. Um, and I found that to be true. I mean, as I engaged in, in peer support of Providence, um, I met primarily LGBTQ identifying veterans and women veterans who we're not going to go to the VA. Um, there was a lot of stigma there. The VA had a lot of stigma. Other veterans at the VA, there was, you know, one person told me about the, the lobby waiting area at the VA, feeling like walking, she felt like she felt like he was walking through a gauntlet every time she went there. You know, I wanted to create space for folks to come and get support from other veterans in a place that they felt safe. I mean, at the end of the day, that's what was going on. So I did see how that can be helpful. I also was... It also was a nice space to move into and really support veterans toward um, LGBTQ specific programming for veterans, either at the VA or Portland Vet Center or Samuel Vet Center, and also um, uh, help women uh, connect with the uh, women's clinic at Portland VA and then, you know, other providers and things that are safe and have a really good reputation in the veteran community around um, supporting veterans who feel marginalized or marginalized by VA healthcare, um, and maybe just the system at large, honestly, you know, and so, um, that answer your question, Alex? Yeah, it does. So you mentioned the veteran family support group. Um, I'm not sure exactly when the next home front is planned to be, but uh, do you care to, to uh, d talk about the difference between what home front is and the support group? Yeah, right now, NAMI home front can access them via the uh, NAMI national, so NAMI, you know, national website. There are online trainings. It's just, you know, it's a class. We're home front now. 
So here in Portland, we don't have any plan, really because we're looking for facilitators for it. Um, NAMI National does have um, home front classes that they, they offer virtually, you know, intermittently and those kind of things. Um, the difference between the family support group, the veteran family support group and, and a home front is that home front's a class. It's a class about skills, techniques, things people can use to support themselves and a veteran that they are living with their son, daughter, husband, whatever. And it could be something that is really about getting information versus getting support. So the family support group is about support and then information is part of that too, but the focus is on uh, peer support, giving each other support versus being a class. And the classes, those are uh, typically uh, taught by family members that are that could be able to empathize with the people taking the class, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Um, all of the programming at, at, at NAMI is, is taught, led, facilitated by someone with lived experience um, and identifies in the culture that they're presenting on and giving the class on. Yeah. Um, I had a question. You had mentioned uh, doing work with people to try to connect them with third-party support. I was wondering what kind of like common third-party support are you handing people off to? Like, are there any organizations you're working with or are there any common services that people are seeking out? Yeah, so... Um, you know, oftentimes the higher level of care is either um, a vet center, a CBOC, or um, the VA, honestly. You know, a lot of times folks are organically moving in those areas. Really thinking about MST and really thinking about culturally specific programming will move to folks toward, um, I have a contact here in Oregon whose name's Ian Michael. He works for Oregon Department of Veteran Affairs. He primarily is a case manager for you know veterans that are looking to apply for um, comp and pen uh, ratings around MSD. Uh, but he also has a lot of connections for LGBTQ identifying veterans support there. And so if I have questions that are outside of the VA system and what systems care are out there in the community, whether the Oregon Department of Veteran Affairs or, or a private organization, I'll usually network through him and get people connected with him. And then he'll uh, talk to them a little bit more about uh, ways to use select care or ways to find space out in the community too. And then as veterans become more and more aware of the work that I'm doing at SNAP and moving into the psychedelic assisted therapies and things, um, I am getting veterans that are applying because they want to know more about that or they have experience with that somehow, some way, and they're just kind of curious about how to hold space there. And so while that's not something that I can resource out to while it's in the study phase, it's at least something I can give support around as a peer integration part of it. And then help connect them with, um, like Zach Skiles, who's my co-facilitator that does uh, private practice stuff um, in psilocybin. And he also, you know, we also have a network of providers out there uh, that do that do legal psych psychedelic assisted therapies here in Oregon already, and you know, start resourcing that way for folks who um, want to know more about that and want to get more experience in zone. Do you have any, um, just out of curiosity, what type of advice do you have? I feel like uh, veterans getting into uh, mental health is starting to pick up pick up some pace do you have uh in your mind just from your position do you have any like efficient paths to, to this of course there's the um the gi bill and stuff like that like uh brian here's doing a master's program trying to get into mental health N nami seems like a, a great way as well getting types of different types of like peer support certifications and whatnot um are these the ways to go is, is there is there other paths that might seem uh, less traveled. Yeah, so you're talking about your questions about veterans who are looking to get to, to become part of uh, mental health conversation, like as a peer, as a provider. Okay, that's a really interesting question. I think that I have two answers, and I think, I think you know, I, I think there's a, I think there's all kinds of different paths, Alex. I mean, it, it, it's that kind of question. I think too that for me, it was nice to, you know, when I when I got started on this, I didn't know if I wanted to even do behavioral health support at all. I didn't know if I had the capacity to do that and how I was going to feel. And so and I didn't know my context. I didn't know if I want to go back to school. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And you know, I had this like wealth of experience and stuff like going through my own healing journey. I just didn't know where to, where to go with it. And so peer support gave me a place to go and volunteer in a lot of different contexts with a lot of different people doing the work and really suss out like where do I fit in? Where do I want to be? Like what 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 I move toward, where am I drawn? And so if I were to sit down with someone, Alex, who had that question, I think I would I would just ask them to open any questions to find out what they were drawn to, and then and then suss that out. So I think that when I'm when I'm thinking about peer support, 
you know, coming through NAMI and, and engaging with our uh, veteran peer support specialist training, which again is free and happens like three to five times a year. That's a great place to start. And then from there, peer support's really flexible. You know, there's a lot of different contexts. You can do it on your own, just privately. You could be a volunteer at a shelter. You can work at a clinic. You can work in the community. You can do it the way we're doing it, where we're just occupying like a really big space, I guess, or trying to, and, you know, do it in a place where it's organically meeting people and sort of forming almost like a friendship bond. I mean, there is like this professional balance that happens with that, but I mean, it really is like a, uh, a very healthy friendship for someone to start to model what their own organic friendships are going to look like. So I guess the traditional way it would sound like, I guess, Alex, I don't know the traditional way necessarily, but it would sound like it would be, you know, go back to school, work on LCSW, work on a doctor in psychology, move those pieces and then do it that way. And that is definitely a track. My track was really to find what could all of my experiences teach me into a place where I could um, do this. I wasn't really drawn to going back to school, to be quite honest. So I was like, I don't know if I'm going to do that at this point. Um, so, I, so I really hope that all the years that I have in recovery would, would help with give me some sort of a degree and it, it really brought me into a space where um I got passionate about learning new ways to hold space and learning new ways to do work and that uh got noticed by um you know Dr. Stockford of Snap Lab and things and I got recruited into that the psychedelic space and really found a home there. Um and also really found a home uh providing you know no barrier very open space holding <laughs> you know peer support out in the community too. So I think for everyone it's it's their journey and their way to find it. But I do think that I do know and I believe that working with veterans in mental health in any context, there's so many different ways to do it that, um, you know, literally anyone could find a role and could find a space to do it in um, if they wanted to. Yeah. Sorry, I was just going to comment on two things. I was just going to say, I really appreciated your approach, you know, to like that initial triage of meeting with clients up front and just giving them space to be heard. And I just think you you really hit on like the most important aspect of that right there, that idea that you're modeling healthy, be, healthier behavior, because a lot of us come from homes where we didn't really see that kind of stuff. And as a result of that, we got into friend groups where we didn't really see that kind of stuff. And so from that point forward, you're never really going to see that kind of stuff. So I think that's really awesome what you're doing regarding that. Um, I was curious, and I was just going to propose a hypothetical. I know you've kind of talked a little bit about what services you guys offer, but say there's a veteran out there that's listening to what we're doing right now. Maybe he's interested in doing individual therapy through NAMI. Maybe he's inter interested in group therapy through NAMI. Like, what would that process of like getting involved look like? Yeah, if someone's so, if someone's interested in they can, either way, they can call me or email me, and I'll, I'll answer their questions and and uh, or like CC them on the person who does the who does the like the volunteer orientation the thing. So one way is if someone's looking for support and they're a veteran, just give them my email address, ask them to give me a call, um, or if you look at our website, um, that that's the easiest way. And then for like volunteering opportunities and things like that, again, they, they can contact me. We also have uh, Sandra Collinger is is a uh, um, our our veteran outreach coordinator she's brand new so right now i feel it in her call but eventually you know i'll just be directing people right to her and she'll be doing all the onboarding and all that for folks who want to volunteer we do have several different ways to volunteer it could be doing uh in her own voice presentations where someone goes and gives a 20 to 30 minute talk about their uh you know what happened what they're doing now and, and what's helping and what they're gonna do next sort of conversation around mental health and their journey and uh, in recovery, and then that's to inform and reduce stigma in the community. And it's uh, those have them pretty common. We also have a similar program that called First Step, and that's in psychiatric inpatients. So folks will go to psychiatric inpatients clinics, wards, and they'll talk about but experience the same thing. And also build that human connection is have a conversation with people uh, that are in inpatient. Um, another program. Uh, that we have is coming up is going to be called like veterans volunteering. We haven't really sussed out the particular name, but it's going to be little cadres of veteran peer support specialists and veterans going to shelters, going to resources in the community, providing peer support on a voluntary basis. Um, my overarching dream with that is eventually to move into a space where we're helping and supporting refugee populations from Iraq and Afghanistan that might be in our area. They're hoping to provide a, um, a restorative um experience from service i think uh, something i was drawn to to do to help me uh work through a lot of moral injury recovery just by by going and right engaging with those populations and providing them support that i think i wish i had been able to uh, a long time ago that i was sort of moved to so i also like the idea of veterans working together and the idea not being hey 
come here for help with the idea of like, hey, come here, we're going to help. And then if along the way you'd like to talk to me about help, cool. <laughs> if not, that's cool too. So making making the conversation around help and support a little more organic rather than being like the front loaded thing of like, we're going to talk about mental illness today. Like it's rather it's going to be, we're going to go out, we're going to volunteer, and then after we're going to go barbecue, we're going to eat some food, and then whatever conversations happen from that start building support around them. We also have volunteers who um, go out and table at events. You know, like the most recent, the recent ones we've done were at uh, the National Guard Base uh, for Yellow Ribbon Programming. We also have uh, Alex went to uh, Napa Community College recently. Uh, we also go to Lions for Life events and galas. We go to wherever we'll also have a table. We have a pretty solid group of people that do that. Um, or say that ask us to do that. We do need more, more volunteers all the time to be in that outreach role and going out talking about our programs. Yeah, I think I answered your question. Also went off on a tangent, but how did I do? <laughs> no, I appreciate that. I mean, that comment you made about working with refugees and moral injury, that's literally something I'd never considered. And it was like, just in that moment, that was just so cathartic inside of me, that thought of just like, because I, it's like we go to their home and it's like, ah, you know, I'd like to introduce you to my Lord and Savior, the U.S. government. <laughs> like, it's like, you've got, you've got some ground to make up there. You know, it's like, oh yeah, that one really hit me. That was, a, that's a lot. Uh, is it correct? Uh, is there any other uh, NAMI uh, base in Oregon that's providing veteran support? And there's one or two in California and then one on the East Coast, other chapters that, that have uh, veteran programming. Their veteran programming looks like uh, either Homefront or the Veteran Family Support Group. Um, NAMI Multnomah, when, when I got hired, there were no veteran programming programs at all here and they they hired me really to start to build space in that i think i've done a good job there um i've needed a lot of help so it's, it's really great that we have a big crew now so at the moment in oregon nami multnomah is the go-to for veteran services nami clackamas is starting to build veteran services as well um i don't know what that's going to look like uh but we are um as far as veteran behavioral health peer support we're doing it the central oregon veteran ranch which is a, just an amazing resource in the Shoots county is also uh, doing the same peer support service. And then there's a select care, or a smaller clinic, but there, there's like a veteran clinic out in like Northwest or Northeastern Oregon that's also uh, providing you know, rural, rural Oregon uh, liaison sort of stuff. And then also a veteran health care out there too, a veteran peer support. So yeah, I mean, at the moment, we're doing the bulk of the like peer support building and moving into the, into what I would call like a, a grassroots organic veteran peer support model. Uh, we're we're it at the moment, but I really feel like as people see it, they're going to start doing their own piece of it. Right now, there's a lot of peer support via you know uh, through MHAO of Oregon, so Mental Health Addiction Associate Addiction. Pardon me, I'm going to hack up their thing, but they're 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 doing peer support. There's not a lot of veteran programming there, but there's also um, uh, do good well know of to access their veteran peer support. You need to be you know, access to the shelter as well. So I think, you know, what I like about our model is there is no, again, there's no screen out for it. It's just anyone who's a veteran literally uh, can access our, can access our programming. And they don't need to identify as a veteran too. I know sometimes uh, veterans do struggle with identifying as a veteran. So um, someone says, hey, I don't identify as a veteran. I served the military, I like help, and that works too. We'll just be where they're at and use the verbiage they like us to use. Yeah, I didn't, uh, I had a feeling that, uh, Multnomah was the only NAMI that had veteran services, but I didn't realize it was even that seldom in the other states as well. Um, but I have a feeling that, you know, with the whole uh, rate of suicides compared to people actually dying uh, when they're deploying, uh, it's, I have a feeling that over these next few years, there's going to be a, a growing influx of veterans that are looking to get into mental health, which is why, which is why I wanted to ask earlier. But for me, definitely, that it's actually a reason why I even myself got in is just going into the, the darkest, the darkest place. And, um, you know, I, I myself have like turned in my all of uh, what's in my safe over to Brian. And I just told him one day, like, I need you to hold on to these for a while. I'm, I'll get back to you. After that point, uh, we got into, you know, introspection and meditation and it's funny because so many people are suffering with these mental illnesses, whether they went to war or did not. And it's so easy to um, shudder at the thought of it and want to bury it away. For myself, it was, I was exploring substances. 
but you know the easy go-to is alcohol i mean the, the military uh culture if you, if you drink then you're part of the club and so uh it's very easy to uh exploit that as a means of coping or just a poor coping mechanism so what i'm what i'm trying to turn this actually back around to, to get to is uh, for yourself, have you found any good methods as far as like introducing uh, meditation to veterans? I myself, when I started, I closed my eyes for a half hour and I was upset that I wasted a half an hour <laughs> because I, my mind, I just couldn't quiet it. And it, it, it I started using uh, like audio recordings, uh, stuff like Hemisync and stuff to kind of trick my brain into getting to that headspace. But it, I, I fell upon it just... Uh, Brian actually introduced it to me one day and I, I never even heard of such a thing. And I don't feel like a lot of veterans are exposed to stuff like that. Uh, do you introduce um, uh, breathing techniques, meditations? What type of stuff do you do and introduce to try to get these people into a, a headspace where they could start becoming introspective? Yeah, I'm keep keeping the joke going. I mean, I, I don't lead with, do you want to meditate? <laughs> because a lot of times it's like, what? <laughs> no. Um, uh, and then, you know, it's so I, I do I do ask some questions to see where someone's at with that, like to see if, if that's part of their process, because I don't want to introduce something that would be will be activating or feel really vulnerable in that moment. I think that, you know, there's a lot of different reasons why meditation could feel really vulnerable and, and why, like, quieting my own mind and being present of what's going on inside me is hard even now after, like, all the work that I've done. So asking somebody this to, like, dry run that, like, right at the, um, right at the get-go could be, be challenging. So I'll start with something simple, like, um, I'll say like, hey, something that helps me before an appointment is, is to breathe a little bit. If you mind, if you want to like, you can join me if you want to. But I'm gonna take a second to sort of ground myself, and I'll sort of work myself through a process and show them. And then if they want to get involved, cool. But I do like a frame it as something like, hey, I'm gonna do this. Is something that I that I really that really helps me out. And I'll keep it really simple. Like I love diaphragmatic breathing as just a way to move in that space where you're taking some deep breaths. One thing I have noticed is that veterans, myself included, we like to like move around and so somatic types of meditations can be wholly helpful um for a lot of reasons i mean it can be really helpful for moving trauma around the body moving it through but also just um as an access point so i'll talk about walks and i know it's kind of cliche but i'll talk about hiking as well i know everybody out there hikes but it's something that um and the ability you know med building a meditation a way to talk about meditation so it's not cookie cutter, you know, it's not one size fits all. We can really talk about helping someone build a meditation routine. And we can even change the word. Like um, I'm working with someone right now where what was helpful for me to say is like, they're like, yeah, yeah, I could take like 15 minutes a day just to sit down and drink some coffee, really in a contemplative space. I'm like, cool, that's a great meditation practice just to really be present in the coffee cup. And I said, and like over time, starting to invite them to do things like Notice how it feels when you're wrapping your fingers around that coffee cup, you know, smell the coffee, you know, do these things and adding little pieces of it that do, that do offer uh, stuff, but building off of something like that, that they're doing already, I think is the key for me is a lot of times people do have something that they're already doing to try to find space for themselves. And it could look like drinking a cup of coffee. It can look like, um, well, I don't condone necessarily smoke a cigarettes. I'd quit myself. That's why I say that. But like, there's some part of our day that we set aside, we ask it's sacred, set aside as ours. Um, and then offering some intentionality around that and making that piece of their day more and more intentional. And then, you know, over time, we'll start bringing in like the Tongue meditations when they really get into it. So I think at first, yes, having an open-ended conversation, Alex, talking about what's going on, the medium where they're at and having it be something that they're excited about, adding to their program and adding to their day. And then as time goes on, like you said, it sounded like you went through an experience where you were like, I don't know about this and now you're doing it. And so I think that there's a point where everyone I've worked with has, has, has done that. But modeling is really helpful. Um, the epiphany that I had in the emergency department was one day supporting someone who was having a difficult time uh, managing their emotions and managing what was going on for them. Like I see they were really struggling. I was too, honestly, because it was coming right out of my own parts and everything. So I needed to do some self-care in a moment and ground. And I'd put my hand on my stomach to do diaphragmatic breathing and literally saw this person just go, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. And so they sat down and were like, <laughs> I was like, okay, cool. Um, so I, I really feel like the modeling, opening questions and then finding something that someone also already has going on their practice that they, that they enjoy doing and building off of that and then building meditation off of that. Um, uh, the somatic um, 
uh, modalities for meditation, I think really help a lot of folks. So a lot of folks that I work with, like end up going to yoga, or Tai Chi, or they go do body work or something like that. It's been really supportive of their meditation process. Yeah, I really dig that example of the coffee cup because like the most therapeutic place to be doing your work is the here and now, you know, and that's what the meditation's doing. That's what smelling the coffee's doing. That's what the diaphragmatic breathing's doing. It's just all like possessing the here and now. In that moment, you can do work. So I have a question for you. Um, I was going to ask a little bit about two things. Number one, membership with NAMI, and then also about becoming a volunteer. I'm going to post two links in the chat. The first one's about joining NAMI, becoming a member. It's just a small annual subscription. But then the other one's about just volunteering your time and uh, getting involved. I didn't know if you had anything you could share about that. Yeah, we're all we're all volunteer run led. We're also a nonprofit. We're grassroots, so we rely on you know our community to support us and the membership helps with that membership also comes with like a magazine <laughs> subscription to like the NAMI newsletter and that kind of stuff. It also is just something that for us, we're really grateful about. We have, you know, times of the year where we do bring, you know, folks together and we talk, we say, thank you. And that kind of part is our, is our space. Um, uh, that's one way to support us. Another way to support us is to volunteer. And again, we're volunteer run. We have a staff of 20 now. We, we've grown a lot through the pandemic because we were able to continue to provide resources through the pandemic and that, we went from like eight, six staff members to 20 in two years, um, you know, via that process. Um, so we do rely on volunteers even more now. And so we have a deep volunteer pool from the community, the general community. We don't have a deep volunteer pool with the veteran community. We have, you know, three or four volunteers that are, uh, you know, pretty routine that we have. We're always looking for more. The way to get in touch and you know, to talk about someone that wants to volunteer is either to call our helpline, email info at namimultnoma.org and to say, hey, I'm looking to volunteer. They can give me a call uh, and then I'll, you know, forward them to um, Sandra or we do have a lot. We have veterans routinely that come in and say, hey, I like to volunteer, but I do not want to volunteer for veteran resources. And so we have resources for the general community too that folks can volunteer with. So it's, I'm a great access point and so is the helpline because then I can direct someone and, um, you know, to our volunteer coordinators. And then once they're connected with a volunteer coordinator, there is a background check. The background checks looking for anything, any harm to a vulnerable population or volunteer, vulnerable community. So like, it's it's not looking for like, I got busted doing drugs. Or I got busted, you know, doing this, that, and the other thing. It's really just looking for, you know, harm that maybe has happened to a vulnerable community. And then from there, there's a volunteer or, uh, a coordination event or onboarding event where the volunteer coordinators talk to everybody that's looking to come on board and talk about what they want to do. We offer training. So someone could come to us with no experience in mental health support at all and volunteer. There's there's no requirement. The only requirement for volunteering is that someone has lived experience as a consumer in mental health recovery because we have training for everything. So all of our presentations, all of our peer support, everything that we do, we have training we can send people to and that'll be free for them to go. With the exception of doing outreach, all of our present, all of our presentation in classes. So if someone teaches class or if someone goes and gives a presentation at a school, let's say, um, those are all paid stipends. And while it's not a little wage, it's like 30 to $50 per, per class or per event or whatever, it's that's at least something to help out. We give back that way too. And then we have volunteer events. We have our own community. We have this growing community of people and we all work with each other. It's also, it's how I ended up getting a job at NAMI was a volunteer. So also a nice place to do that. It also looks really good for folks who are like a peer support specialist that are looking for ways to volunteer. That volunteer time counts as experiences. Experience, a lot of the resources out there in our area to include the VA know what NAMI is, have a lot of respect for NAMI. And so that's valid. The volunteer experience is valid on a resume as well. It's really helpful for people who are looking to move into different roles too. So there's a lot of different, there's a lot of give back also, I want to say. So I want to say that we really try to make our experience for the volunteers is something that really helps them out too and help them, you know, locate work, locate other volunteer opportunities, um, locate a plan to buy lunch that day or whatever it might be. And so it's, uh, there is give back and there is people are getting something out of it for themselves too, uh, while they're, you know, giving all of what they got to support someone else. Yeah. Um, I, I want to just uh, take a quick step back. Um, I feel, um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, if I'm wrong, I, I apologize, but I, I think Brian was asking previously about services that NAMI provided, but he mentioned them as, as therapies. NAMI does not provide therapy. Uh, we're the peer support specialist is the title. And so if, if you're actually looking for someone uh, looking for an actual therapist, NAMI is, is not, doesn't provide that, is it correct? Just wanted to make sure that we're we're covered on that. 
just uh, wanted to ask uh, in the chat or anyone on, on the video here, does anyone have any questions so far? No, Larry? I have two follow-up questions real quick. Um, I understand that you had done some maps training recently and I was wondering if you might be able to speak a little bit about that. I know this probably has more to do with SNAP than with NAMI, but I just, it seemed like such an interesting you know, opportunity. What great timing. Yeah, so I just, I, I went to the, uh, uh, MAPS Bronx VA MDMA assisted therapy training retreat a couple weeks ago. Just got back, finished all my online requirements. Things got, I've been approved by MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, to be a uh, principal facilitator on the MDMA for PTSD group therapy, the FEG1 phase one study for MDMA at the approval. It's going on at uh, the SNAP lab and well, it's going on at Portland VA. Um, I work for the VA Research Foundation and SNAP, so I like to say that that's, I don't work for VA proper because VA proper is still trying to figure out if they want us or not, you know, but, but we have, there's a lot of really good research to come in there. I think that what I'm really excited about coming through that training and being able to experience that as a peer support specialist, it was, that's a very new concept. And to be able to do, to be able to be a principal facilitator on it, uh, you know, when I say facilitator, I do mean like integration specialist, facilitation and psychotherapy that happens during an MDMA session or, or a, a, a psilocybin is very non-directed, indirected, it's all about inner healing intelligence. So it was fun getting to watch providers learn how to take a step back and move into a very quiet, non-directed space. And it was something that, you know, as a peer, we do organically, it's their scope of work from the get-go. So what I was really excited too, I mean, getting my own education out of getting my certification to do that and then move into this space was really awesome. It was also really awesome to see MAPS and then Big VA really notice like what peer support specialists can, can bring into, into the psychedelic assisted space. MAPS also added a moral injury component to talk about that. We saw a lot of case videos. What struck me first, I'm, I'm eternally a skeptic and I think it really helps me in my work a lot, but I, you know, I came in there going, wow, this research data is like looks incredible. Like seeing someone move from being very much in PTSD, very much stuck in that, having a lot of symptoms going on and really struggling to um, a year after the MDMA assisted therapy, having no diagnosis for PTSD anymore and not being diagnosable for PTSD and moving in that space. So that was, seeing that research on paper was one thing, but then going and watching case video after case video of uh, veterans and 9-11 um, uh, first responders like move through their recovery journey with PTSD and moral injury, hearing their testimony seeing those seeing them do, do the work i think that that for me that's what validated that this is something really special and that it's, it's not just the medicine that's going on the medicine is also the way we're holding space and inviting someone inside to do their work and letting them sell and letting them start to heal themselves and work with all the different parts that come up uh, during that and by parts i do mean like ifs um modalities and parts of ourselves that protect us from trauma and so it was watching like the the uh someone have space to touch it, experience their trauma and be, be emotionally connected to it. And then also watching how facilitation can engage with archetypes that come up and, you know, talk to the, you know, talk to them in a way that's also very love and support for those archetypes as well as the individual it was a really incredible thing to see, you know, to watch someone sort of talk to an inner child that got coming present and then talk to the protector that wants the inner child to go back inside and, and really holding that space in a very safe, loving way. Um, so as people are activated, I've watched like the facilitators, you know, in this case, it was Michael and Andy who were like meeting the archetype with what, what is it you want to tell me? And then they get a response and they would say that, you know, and they would really work with someone in that space and not at all think it was strange or something that someone was experiencing this, this other identity while they're in that space, rather than I think, you know, a lot of times there's stigma around that or there's conversations around that. I think it was nice to see someone hold that in a very normal and also a very loving kindness place that really helped the inner child come out of its of its womb, like out of the shell, and it's watched people over time move from a very dissociated. I can remember myself being a very dissociated, numbed out place, moving toward um, post traumatic growth and into post traumatic growth, and then you know, really reclaiming themselves and being their full self again, and um, having a lot of emotional content and being moved toward uh, doing like a lot of incredible work and giving back really quickly. Um, so what I saw in addition to someone's CAP C score going down to zero or whatever, non-diagnosable PTSD was also people who were finding joy and love and happiness in their life again after after trauma. And 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 our group that went through the cohort, 
It was about six of us. We went through our own journey too. I mean, it felt like we were in like a week long psychedelic assisted session. We were not, but it felt like it by the end, we had so much processing and so much work with each other that it was also beautiful to see what, what a human community and what people who have like, we've all worked through what we need to work through throughout the week bond like that, stay in touch and uh, feel like a renewed vigor for, for this work and hope that as we explore these new modalities and we explore this new space and that that people really can heal on it and really can move through trauma and really can come into such a loving and kind container from where they started to experience that for themselves. And like I had full buy-in once I got out of there and I came back and I was really excited to hear um, that we're going to be able to do that study and that we're getting closer and closer to FDA approval and clinical approval for the for those modalities. Uh, would you mind uh, uh, speaking to what a CAPC score is? And then um, as far as the work that you're you're doing with, with veterans, um, have you been surprised by maybe how how early? Because I, I, how many sessions would uh, would these take place in? And have you been by chance surprised by how early in the process that people are reaching uh, low scores on CAPC? Yes, yeah, so CAPC score. So I'm a I'm a non clinician going to explain to you what a CAPC score. Is, so I'll do my best. A CAPC score is a number, and the higher the number, the higher di the PTSD and complex PTSD that person is experiencing symptom wise. And so um, a lot of folks that either the VA or about sign or OHSU had experienced in the MDMA research, we had a CAPC score of over 100. Um, and, you know, it moved down to zero to two to five a year after therapy. And I think it was important to note there, Alex, I think you just asked the question around it is um, psilocybin and MDMA assisted therapies look a little bit different the way we're uh, facilitating them. Um, as far as like the number of um, appointments go and things are really similar. So there's nuanced difference in the facilitation aspect of it, but as far as like the appointments go and, and what someone experiences is really similar. So it's between four and five preparatory sessions, preparing someone for uh, the assisted day. Um, and in that space, we talk about, you know, any meditation practices go on. We do a lot of informed consent. We get to know someone more than anything. We're getting to know someone building their first rapport and trust in the preparatory space. What we don't do is tell anybody what to expect <laughs> in, in in the assisted day. So we don't talk about like what my experience was like or anything like that. We really just talk to someone about, you know, what someone might experience symptom wise or what someone might experience side effect wise. Like, you know, you, you might feel cold, your body temperature is going to be okay. We're going to be doing heart rate checks. We're going to be doing these pieces. We talk about therapeutic touch as part of the work that we do. So prep is all about just prepping. And then we have two in psilocybin and MDMA, there's two sessions that are assisted and they're eight to 10 hours long where we're sitting with someone for 10 hours where they go through their, their journey. Psilocybin and MDMA are different nuance wise the way psilocybin, we don't do a lot of talking to facilitators. MDMA, there's a little more conversing going on with, and it's non directive, but there's more talking with participants than there would be in psilocybin. Psilocybin, we're, we're doing a lot of space holding for about four to six hours, and then maybe we start talking. Of the side from advice to go inside or to monitor music or to monitor this and other thing. So it's really just about holding physical safety um, during those long eight to 10 hour sessions. And then integration, there's three or four integration sessions after each um, full day. So we'll do integrations about normalizing the experience, bringing into everyday goals, bringing it into our practice, someone really sussing out like what they experienced and what it means to them. We'll invite journaling and those kind of pieces to start to integrate like what occurred and what came up during the during the uh, assisted session. And then before we end, we do four integration sessions. Um, another difference is that the MAPS group will be um, about six veterans um, in MDMA therapy, therapy together uh, with four facilitators. Facilitators will be two, a PsyD, an MD, and then two peer integration specialists in a room with six veterans um, uh, doing the uh, uh, MDMA assisted therapy together. Uh, psilocybin is one-on-one. -on -one. Um, psilocybin is for meth and MDMA is for PTSD recovery. Um, MDMA is going to have a little bit more in the integration sense um, because we're also going to work with people individually, talk about their experience too, and break them out of the group and, and meet them individually and talk about integration that way as well. And the reason I say like after a year is because oftentimes folks 
the folks that are we say oftentimes, but right now the folks that are working with us are in care. So once they've concluded their um, eight to ten week experience with us, they move back to treatment as usual. So they'll move back to their providers, whether it be substance abuse treatment or or PTSD or both, and they'll continue in therapy beyond um, what we what we the work we've done with them. Um, and then we stay in touch, um, and we follow up in six months, we follow up in a year, and we follow up three years after. With people and as folks engage in our therapy, they get my number, they get uh, my co facilitator's number, and they can just talk to us as they need to. Honestly, like we don't like to break contact with someone who's gone as deep as they go um, um, in the in the psychedelic system. We don't want it because they they really do form. We really do form like a bond with the people we work with. And we also think it really helps to support integration if someone has someone they can talk about multiple times about what came up and as it evolves and as it shifts. Uh, while they engage in life, yeah. you said uh, three up to three years after. Has that came up yet? Is is this been that long to reach that threshold yet? Not not for us. Um, okay. For for maps, yeah. I mean, the, in the, the folks that did the phase phase two and phase three studies, the phase three studies just completed like I think Tuesday, just completely went through their fruition. But the um, um, a lot of the data that we were presented at the retreat was three years and people they followed three years after um, continue to talk to and and it, it was it was somewhat shocking I mean looking you know seeing someone who's you know really in there really in PTSD really really going through it and then three years later you know there's one there's one cat that's out like helping refugees out in Jordan there's another guy that's you know writing books doing seminars doing that stuff and TED talks and things like moving into this new space with himself and so it's I'm glad they're having those three-year follow-ups because I think it also validates a lot of the data that can look really sort of too good to be true in a sense. I mean, I was going to throw it out there, but like again, ha having those follow-ups I think is really important. So I'm glad that we're doing it too. It is part of the studies um, metric to make sure that we're doing those follow-ups and that there isn't, especially if there isn't a termination anxiety around um, moving moving forward in their progress. We want to try and nullify that as much as possible. Yeah, it, it in a lot of cases that I'm that I'm seeing it it does seem too good to be true. It's it's funny how it's like we're turning mental health uh, on its head. It's like I've said it before that I just especially yeah. in just uh, being in that situation myself, I thought PTSD was well, you're well, you're going to be abusing substances and having bad coping skills until you kill yourself. And um, it's just it's just funny how how drastically things are changing now that we're. Uh, getting away from the stigma of some of these substances and actually exploring with like intent to uh and re just responsible use and uh it's 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 shaking how um how we just what we're getting out of it and it's uh i can't i just can't uh i can't hope for enough that just uh people as far as like politics are concerned are gonna just uh just open their eyes and uh be more open to these these concepts but you know, you know, the process is rolling, so we, we just hope for the best and uh, continue to, you know, vote and do our play our part as people and uh, in the community, just awareness and education. So, and that's why we're here. Brian, do you have anything? No, I was just going to comment about you know that whole too good to be true aspect of it. Um, I'm I'm working on getting a uh, degree in like a traditional form of uh, psychology, trying to get an LMFT. Um, but I'm in my classes and they're candid with us and they say that the best prevailing research, traditional therapy only helps like 13% of the clients. And out of those 13% of the clients, 7% of it's based entirely on the relationship with the uh, practitioner. And so it's almost like if you would survey them based on how many friends they'd have, they really just need a friend, you know? And so just to be able to hear what you're talking about, it's like, it's something so much more meaningful than just that simple, like one-on-one -on -one transactional relationship. It's like self-examination, self-exploration -explor that leads to you reframing your perspective and your relationship with this world and I think that's really where there's you know the majority of the power and the opportunity so no that's just like it warms my heart to hear that because uh, just me me putting my feet into this right now it's like 
it's not very hopeful. You know, I look at a lot of the prevailing research and the strategies that they're using. It's kind of like, wow, this isn't really going to do much for most people. You know, it's like, so just to see that this is such an effective outcome and that there are statistical, you know, research that's being done to support it, particularly with that three-year survey too, because one of the common traits of like our modern therapy techniques is that we anticipate people will take steps back. So in order to see three years down the road and watch people, you know, literally reframing their relationship with the world is just, I mean, what more could you ask for? You know, it's like, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's, it, 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 yeah, you're right. You hit, hit the nail on the head with the interdirected piece too. It's like watching someone say like, you know, I've found a way to help heal myself. I found this way to do that and have that and have that be someone's, someone's reality. And then um, my sort of side hope for all of this is as we move through it, I'm, I, I really feel like we're going to, we will continue to find ways that, you know, we as an individual can be the medicine for someone else. Like we as a person can, can hold space in a way where just organically, this, this is teaching us a way to facilitate, teaching us a way to hold space that, you know, we, we ourselves become, become that container, become that friend, become that, that individual that can support someone as they begin to move to that space. And, you know, what a wonderful thing to be able to do, especially in a non-directive sort of way, you know, and it is, it is a little mind blowing, but you know, you're right. There's all the data out there. There's a lot of data out there right now to support that is effective and we, we keep, we keep going. And, you know, I'm a person who, I'm, I, I'm so hopeful that I try to keep my expectations very, very grounded because because I think I want to go out and like celebrate all of this right now. And there's part of me that just kind of leans into the work and gets it easy to work. But there's a part of me that's also like gleeful because I'm, I have witnessed folks in my own work move to a place of insight and recovery that took me years and years and years of traditional therapy to get to and just observing that as an individual. Like I'm one day as like tears streaming down my face as I, as I recognize the person and I'm working with and moved into a space and inside with himself in truth that, that took me so much so much work to do and they did it and they were able to do it now in a new space where they felt cared for and they felt seen they felt loved and they and they and they were doing it on their own you know it was just I was just I was fucking crying I'm gonna have to lie it was really sweet to see <laughs> and that's just so huge for them to be doing the work on their own it's like in that moment they're validating not just their existence but their future there's something to work on and I think that's when a lot of people who've lived through trauma forget that there's something to live on to it's like we're just stuck you know so yeah yo I'm I'm grateful for what you guys are doing I'm really grateful for you coming and sharing all this information absolutely yeah, 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 it's uh, it's it's a beautiful thing, like just to uh, get out of that dark, dark space, dark place, and um, it's kind of like rediscovering life again. In that, it's like you're kind of uh, surprised in just how much more you could actually do instead of, well, I mean, people that that are here that uh, have experienced being in that dark space, it's just um, you have blinders on, and it's like when you get when you have them taken off, it's it's kind of like um. Yeah, it's rediscovering the world, rediscovering life and what it could be, and it's a it's the exciting, beautiful thing. And uh, I'm, I'm I, I agree with you, Dan. I want to go out and celebrate as well, but um, we're not quite there yet. I feel I feel like, I feel like there's still still a couple more thresholds we still need to break. But um, yeah. Well, hey, uh, we, I, could, we could definitely still our work, and we can definitely celebrate the work that people are doing right now in their own computer. You know, we can celebrate those pieces. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right, right. Miss, right. The world will change as well. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, I, I think you uh, uh, appreciate you so much, Dan, for coming with us uh, and joining us for the show today. Uh, in the audience, thank you guys for joining us. Um, if you're watch going to be watching this on YouTube um, and like to join us live for a future show, uh, feel free to visit our meetup page. I'll post a link for, for that in the description and check out our calendar for any future shows coming up. We meet on the third Sunday of every month at 11 a.m. And uh, if you'd like, um, Dan mentioned them earlier in the show. Uh, next month, we'll be meeting with Allison Perry, uh, and she's the founder and executive director of the Central Oregon Veteran Ranch. So uh, make sure you check that out for December. Uh, she's taught, telling us about a documentary that they had uh, that they were um, that they had shown in uh, California. So we're going to talk about what type of services and stuff that they have going on. And um, yeah, I'll, if you want to join us for December, then uh, join us for that. With that, thank you again, guys, for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Have a great month. Thank you.